If I had the possibility, the chance, the opportunity, then I will interview him for many days. He is one of the greatest and famous religious scholars in contemporary Muslim world. He has many scientific achievements, scholar books, articles, essays regarding many critical and crucial issues in contemporary world, especially political Islam, Islam morality in general, history, politics, dialogue between civilizations and the mechanisms of rebuilding the bridges between religions and civilizations. He is a political philosopher, Sheikh Omran Nazar Hossein, with whom I have the privilege and honor to get an interview today. I am Abraham Gasparian, Doctor of Politics, expert in Middle Eastern Studies, TV host and founding director of Genesis Armenia Pan-Armenian Think Tank. Good evening. Okay. Good evening, Sheikh. Thank you. Thank you. Sheikh, first I would like to welcome you to our country, Armenia, and on behalf of the Armenian nation, congratulate you and the world Muslim world for the holy day of sacrifice, Eid al-Adha al-Mubarak. Uh, it is a very, very important and uh, honor for me to take this interview. Are you ready for a deep and hard talk today? Uh, thank you, our brother Abraham, uh, for this uh, kind invitation uh, to be interviewed uh, here in Armenia. I must first of all uh, begin in the name of the Lord God and to praise Him and pray for peace and blessings on all His noble messengers. Um, but first of all, let me explain to the viewing audience that uh, I have fallen ill in mm -hmm. Armenia and I'm 83 years of age by the moon. That's why I didn't stand up to greet you and uh, <laughs> you'll have to excuse my coughing uh, during the interview. No problem. Uh, Sheikh, I guess that your first visit to the first country which adopted Christianity as a religious state is not an accident. Uh, so, why Armenia? Why post-war Armenia? Uh, and why now, nowadays? And what are the main messages that you bring to us and by Armenia to the world? I began because of my Islamic eschatology by recognizing Russia as the most important country for me to visit. And I did visit Russia in 2013. And then I recognized Greece to be a very important country for Islamic eschatology because of Hagia Sophia. Mm -hmm. But now, as I reach, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting more, <laughs> more and more depth in Islamic eschatology. Knowledge is increasing. And you know, uh, Brother Abraham, that the river of knowledge flows at its own speed. Yeah. So only now, in the late afternoon of my scholarship, I'm recognizing Armenia to be the most important country for me in the Christian world, the right. Orthodox Christian world, and Pakistan to be the most important country in the Muslim world. Uh, this is because I'm struggling to build friendship fraternity mm -hmm. between our two peoples mm -hmm. and there are obstacles in the way. There are evil forces which, which have been at work for the last 600 years mm -hmm. to sabotage mm -hmm. the end, end time friendship and alliance and no people have suffered more mm -hmm. than the Armenian people. Mm -hmm. So they are the ones who are the key mm -hmm. to reconciling our two people. Sheikh, uh in general, you speak about tolerance, about uh, peace, about uh, dialogue between nations and religions. Uh, some people wonder if Sheikh Amran 
uh, let's say, has the courage, so-called courage, to tell these messages from the centers of Armenophobia, for example, from Ankara or Baku? There are places that I will not visit, mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. There are places where I'm not welcome because of my profile of scholarship. And uh, um, it is only the, it is the road of wisdom mm -hmm. that I should come to those places where I'm welcome mm -hmm. and where I have the freedom to speak. I will most certainly not have the freedom to speak in Turkey. They might do another Khashoggi on me. Mm -hmm. And I have condemned the government of, Army, of Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan for having become the government, not the people, a client of Israel. Mm -hmm. That when they wage war on Armenia, they took, they took weapons, they took drones from Israel. Israel is the world's greatest oppressor after the United States. Mm -hmm. And if you are taking weapons and drones from Israel to wage war on a people, you will become a client of Israel. So, I, I would not be welcome in Azerbaijan, but the people of Azerbaijan are listening to me. Mm -hmm. uh, Sheikh, uh, Armenians have venerable relations with Muslims in general from the 7th century. Uh, most Armenian minorities or communities in diaspora, especially in the Middle East, from Syria to Iraq, Lebanon, Jerusalem, Iran, they know Islam very well. So, uh, from the Armenian tribunes, so-called, what are the, uh, the famous or, or uh, the key messages that you uh, want to tell? Well, there are millions, perhaps, around the world because of your profile and because of my eschatology, will be viewing this uh, interview. And uh, my people are already familiar with my views mm -hmm. that um, the Ottoman Empire was an oppressor. And those who differ with me, I don't care two peanuts for them. Mm -hmm. I am going to proclaim the truth regardless mm -hmm. of consequences. I say to them, you can kill a man, but you cannot kill the truth. Mm -hmm. And the Ottoman Empire was an oppressor. Mm -hmm. and the religion which has come from the Lord God has zero tolerance for oppression. But this world is a moral order. That's what the Quran says yeah. again and again. This world is a moral order. And the implications of this world being a moral order is that justice must eventually prevail. Mm -hmm. No people have suffered more. No people have suffered more from the Ottoman Empire than the Armenian people. Mm -hmm. And so I come to them to tell them that there is a sunshine coming in the future. The sun will shine for the Armenian people. All the tears that you have had in these last 600 years, particularly the 30 years of genocide, mm -hmm. those 30 years of genocide, all the tears, all the suffering that you have endured, that there is a tomorrow which is coming mm -hmm. when an army prophesied by our prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, will conquer Constantinople. I don't use the name mm -hmm. Istanbul because my prophet used the name Constantinople. Constantinople. And you cannot stop me from using that name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when uh, you turn to Islamic eschatology and to the Orthodox Christian world, the most important subject in Islamic eschatology is the prophesied conquest of Constantinople in the end time. And during this one week that I've been here in, in Armenia, and I'm grateful to the Lord God who allowed me to come, I have not concentrated on any other subject mm -hmm. than on this subject. Because to speak, give you a brief uh, implication of the conquest of Constantinople, mm -hmm. number one, it will free the Bosphorus, which is under NATO control. Yeah. Because Turkey is not only a member of NATO, but comfortably so, and seeking to get others to join NATO. Yeah. That's Turkey. Yes. 
And so the Bosphorus will be free, will be freed. And that will allow the Russian Navy after the Great War, because you won't have aircraft after that. Mm -hmm. The Russian Navy will be able to pass through the Bosphorus into the Mediterranean. And that is bad news for Israel. The second implication of the conquest of Excuse me, excuse me, Sheikh. Some people accuse you for conspiracy theory. This is conspiratorial theory or not? Our prophet has prophesied. Mm -hmm. He said, "Latafthanna al Constantinia." You will most certainly conquer Constantinople. Mm -hmm. وَلَنِعْمَ الْأَمِيرُ أَمِيرُهَا وَلَنِعْمَ الْجَيْشُ ذَلِكَ الْجَيْشُ And he praised the army. He praised the commander. Why nowadays? He praised, he, he, he prophesied a conquest of Constantinople which will take place after the Great War. The brainwashing which has been taking place these 600 years mm -hmm. is that the conquest of Constantinople prophesied by our prophet took place in 1453 by a Sultan Muhammad Fatih mm -hmm. who violated, violated the law of war in the Quran. He violated the law of war in the Quran. And I want to remind our viewing audience because the Quran says, if your enemy wants peace, you must reciprocate. That's the law of war. Yeah. The patriarch, the Christian patriarch in Constantinople mm -hmm. did not want war. war. In, he in had 1453, only, yeah. Yeah, he had about 9,000 men mm -hmm. and the Sultan had surrounded Constantinople no, no. with perhaps 200,000. The Sultan abandoned the Quran, betrayed the Quran, put the Quran aside and proceeded with war in violation of the law of war in Islam. What do you think the Ottoman Empire cut the positive perception of Islam among the Christians or not? There are certain positive uh, aspects of Ottoman rule. For example, the last free and fair market that the world experienced was the market of the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. where they used gold and silver coins as money. They had, they had police in the market, and anyone found violating the law of business in the market, for example, in debasing the coin mm -hmm. and chipping the coin, yeah. they would be arrested. The magistrates were in the market. They'll be tried in the market and they'll be punished in the market. So the Ottoman Empire has to be credited for preserving the free and the fair market, the last people in the world. Secondly, the Ottoman Empire was able to bring people of many different nations and tribes yes. and to live harmoniously. Uh, harmoniously. And Western civilization says, no, you have to integrate into our way of life. Mm -hmm. So take off your hijab. It's shameful. They should learn from the Ottoman Empire. So I, when the Ottoman Empire did something good, I have to credit them mm -hmm. for it. But when they wage bogus war, violating the law of war in the Quran, in conquering Constantinople as they did in 1453, I have to call a spade a spade. Mm -hmm. I have no hesitation in speaking this way. And when he conquered Constantinople, what's the first thing that he did? The Quran orders, orders the believers to protect the church, the cathedral, the Jewish synagogue, the masjid. Fight if necessary to protect them. Instead of protecting Hagia Sophia, what he did to the eternal shame and disgrace of the world of Islam, he converted Hagia Sophia to a masjid and that was shameful that was disgraceful that was sinful Sheikh, we are speaking about constantinople about Hagia sophia we know that the fascistic methodology to islamize the uh, whole human val value Hagia sophia by the fascistic regime of turkey uh, is a new uh, 
conflict nowadays for the third Rome estafette for Russia, for Christian world in general, and between the Islamic world. What do you think? The, the last thing that the enemy wants, and the enemy are those who use power to take control of the world in the wars of imperialism and colonization of the world. And then when they had controlled the world and corrupted the world with the indescribable capacity to corrupt and to destroy, mm -hmm. they then brought the Jews back to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own. Mm -hmm. The Quran identifies them as Gog and Magog. This is Islamic eschatology. The last thing that they want to see is an alliance between the world of Islam and the world of Orthodox Christianity. The next last thing they want to see is an alliance between Russia and China. Yes. Uh, Armenians, Assyrians, many other national and religious minorities during the Ottoman Empire, while were loyal citizens of that state, of that empire. But Armenians also were Zemis, Al Zima. Let me make a quotation from the Holy Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Yaqulu Ta'ala, La yanhaakum Allah an al-lazina yuqatilukum fi al-deen wa lam yukhrijukum min diyarikum أن تبروهم وتقصط إليهم إن الله يحب المقصطين صدق الله العظيم سورة الممتحنة. The core concept and column of Islam is justice. To what extent do Turkey has a connection nowadays with justice and Islam? Now we have to go back to the term zimbi before we can turn to modern day. You quoted from the Quran. Yes. A Christian would become a zimmi in the territory of Islam, or Darul Islam, only when you have waged war against them and yes. defeated them, provided it is a just war. And the law of war in Islam is that you must first explore and exhaust all possible peaceful means of resolving a problem which, which, which provokes war before you wage war. The Ottoman Empire was created to wage war. It was a war machine from day one to the end of the world. Armenians deported from their homeland. Their uh, property was stolen and uh, Savage criminal genocide occurred against them between 1925 and 19, uh, 1915 and 1923. Uh, nowadays, we have more than five mil million Armenians who adopted Islam as a religion, but they are living on their homeland. My question is, how Islam can identify this problem? Were the Armenian Zimmis? Can you describe them and categorize the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire as Zimmis? They were Zimmis. No, were they? that's what the Ottoman Empire did. But today, here, it is the truth which must prevail. Did the Ottoman Empire wage a just war on the Armenians? Which schoolboy would say that? It was a planned and organized a strategy against Armenians to uh, make a genocide against them. They had a bigger plan than that. What the Ottoman Empire was doing from an eschatological viewpoint mm -hmm. is they were sabotaging mm -hmm. over 600 years and their successors are continuing that evil work of sabotaging mm -hmm. end time reconciliation, friendship and alliance between our two peoples. So the Armenians were not Zimmis in our law, in Ottoman law, yes. yes. But they were, the they were not Zimmis. They were not Zimmis. When 
if people have not, they don't have the status of Zimmis, and they are in the Darul Islam, yes. and they are Christians, they are Jews, then our law is that we have to build a plural model, a, a political model, that is a plural model, to accommodate them with us, so that they will have their freedom, and we'll have our freedom, which is what our Prophet did in Medina, the plural model yes. of a state. That's the alternative to Zimbi. But the Ottoman Empire didn't care for the Quran. And today it must be said as plainly and clearly as possible. They converted Hagia Sophia to a masjid to the eternal shame and disgrace of the world of Islam. And now the latter day Ottomans have done it for the second time. And my voice is being raised to condemn that and to tell them that when we conquer Constantinople, not just the Bosphorus will be opened, but we will return Hagia Sophia to those to whom it rightfully belongs. When I went to the University of Belgrade mm -hmm. and I spoke in the auditorium packed, mm -hmm. they were crying. <laughs> they were crying mm -hmm. when they heard these words because nobody ever told this to them. But in addition to that, when we conquer Constantinople, the law of Islam is that you must stand with the oppressed, not the oppressor. And a people who have been driven from their homes and from their land, their homeland for no just cause, when we conquer Constantinople, Abraham, they have the right to return. Sheikh, nowadays we see global rules-based economy. The process of globalization in general is disputing the particularity of identities in general. In your opinion, in your point of view, uh, how do evaluate the civil society's engagement and narratives of democratization in general nowadays? And in the Islamic world particularly. Do you see, for example, any connection between the Arab Spring movement in general, uh, which occurred uh, mostly in Muslim states, Arab states, and between color revolutions in Christian states? The terminology of globalization, what's the Armenian word for the Antichrist? Ner. 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 <laughs> Globalization is actually bringing all of mankind into a melting pot, a secular melting pot, and hence a godless melting pot. Globalization is the destruction not only of the diversity of mankind to which you mm -hmm. just referred, the flowers in the garden. Mm -hmm all have different colors. But no, you must dress the way we dress. Mm -hmm. You must talk the way we talk. You must live the way we live. Yes. And we live a way of life in which a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. This is moral degradation. Yes. And that's where the they take us. The defeat of morality in general. And if you don't submit to them, if you don't submit to their evil agenda, their feminist revolution, mm -hmm. they attack you with inflation. Mm -hmm. They gave you bogus money. The most, the most dangerous weapon that NAR has is inflation. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this modern Western civilization is taking mankind to a new slavery. And the political mm -hmm. science should be... A political scientist should be able to discern that, that we are moving to a new slavery. And our viewing audience around the world who agree with us would ask, what should we do about it? How do we respond to this? Uh, they call it democracy. They call it a rule-based international order. And uh, they dress up on a Sunday morning and go to churches. Respectable people, they're not. It's a barbarian civilization controlled at its core by a decadent people. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. who are waging war on mankind on behalf of NAR, of the yes. Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Our response is, our people and your people must come together mm -hmm. in friendship and alliance. You, excuse me, you say our, what do you mean by our? Our people and who your people. They? Our people meaning those who follow Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him. And your people mean those who follow the Messiah rather than Santa but, Claus. But like Christians, Muslims also not homogeneous. I didn't hear. Not homogeneous in their thinking, way of thinking. It, uh, there are many uh, problems uh, within. Uh, yes. We have these, diversity uh, in the world of Islam. You have diversity in Christianity also. In the Christian world, I'm talking about the East, the Eastern Orthodox Christian world. But it is the defining characteristic of truth mm -hmm. when it enters the heart who can bring people of diverse cult cultures, mm -hmm. diverse languages, diverse ways of life, and bring them together in a fraternity of faith. And that's what's going to happen in the days that lie ahead. Look at the rece reception I have got in Armenia. Mm -hmm. I have a team which organized my visit to Armenia. The head of the team is not a Muslim. Mm -hmm. He's an Orthodox Christian from Georgia, mm -hmm. a Givog, a wonderful man. And I have here Karnig, mm -hmm. who is here from Yerevan. And these people have worked day and night for a Muslim scholar to come. Mm -hmm. This is good news for the future, that we will be able to overcome this, uh, these obstacles of diversity and bring unity in our ranks, the unity of those who are holding on to the truth. Sheikh, Ibn Khaldun's understanding of civilization, V.S. Samuel Huntington's clash of civilizations. What can Islam offer a new concept for new understanding and view of tolerance between the nations and religions? Number one, zero tolerance for oppression. It matters not whether it is in the camp of Islam or in the camp of the Christians or the Jews. Mm -hmm. There can be no reconciliation between people. There can be no friendship and uh, stability in a society when there is oppression. Mm -hmm. And so what we speak for, speak of for the future, mm -hmm for mankind, for different civilizations, is that all those who stand with us mm -hmm. in resisting oppression mm -hmm. must come together. It matters not to me whether he's a Jew mm -hmm. or Hindu or someone who is secular in his scholarship from London, from you know, New York. And there are so many in the modern West who are excelling much better than our scholars are in opposing the oppression in the monetary system. Mm -hmm. this International is the, monetary system. I am amazed by their scholarship. And so how can, how can we resist reaching out to people who are prepared to have the courage, they have the integrity to stand up to oppression? This is the most dangerous disease affecting mankind mm -hmm. all around the world today. It is oppression. If the Indian government is an oppressor, no Hindu should be annoyed with me for pointing at the Indian government of Modi and calling a spade a spade. And if Turkey is pursuing the same policy of oppression that the Ottoman Empire did, I must have the courage to point to Turkey and condemn them for their oppression. Excuse me, contemporary Turkey, the Turkish state, is the organic continuation of Ottoman Empire. Of course. And, uh, for example, we Armenians lost our homeland, Western Armenia. And uh, nowadays when we speak about tolerance or rebuilding the bridges between nations, we have a big problem here. 
Turkey says <clears throat> that there is no genocide. <laughs> Uh, it was just uh, an arrangement during the First World War and the deportation of Armenians from their homeland was a technical issue. But we lost our homeland, Western Armenia, now. I've already told you that this was not accidental. This oppression was not accidental. It was not a technical matter. What they were doing from our Islamic eschatological perspective is they were sabotaging mm -hmm. the possibility of end time reconciliation and friendship and alliance. I am here in Armenia to, to try to resolve this problem and to get the Armenian people to know that there, are, there is a true Islam mm -hmm. and there is a bogus Islam. Mm -hmm. A true, true Muslims can never be oppressors. Mm -hmm. And history cannot end until true Islam prevails over bogus Islam. Mm -hmm. This is my message. We are not prepared to reach out to the oppressor, to build any kind of peaceful relations with the oppressor. Yes, on the battlefield we can have a truce. That's right, yeah. but not friendship, not peaceful relations between us, because you are an oppressor. And modern Turkey, not the Turkish people. Yes, yes, yes. We there are, are speaking many, about the state. There are many in Turkey, many in Turkey who will be a part of that army, mm -hmm. prophesied by the Prophet, Allah's blessing mm -hmm. upon it, which will conquer Constantinople. And I want these words of mine to reach them. Not only would the Bosphorus be open? Not only would we return Hagia Sophia to those to whom it rightfully belongs, not only would the city be restored, the name would be restored to Constantinople, but as we said, the Quran has declared that a people who have been driven out of their homes, and uh, this is Western Armenia, driven out of their homes, driven out of their homeland for no just cause. When we conquer Constantinople, they will have the right to return to their homeland in Western Armenia. Sheikh, this issue is very critical and very crucial. The problem of modernization of political systems in general, in the Muslim world, in the Christian world also, uh, is meeting the wall of rejection by many religious circles. Your opinion, please. Well, first of all, you referred to globalization, and now you're referring to modernization. Let me take one small part of modernization. We, in the religious way of life, we know that there's something called blasphemy, to blaspheme mm -hmm. against the Lord God. They don't speak about this in this classroom of political science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, <laughs> they speak. <laughs> That, the, that it is a mortal sin. In Islam, we call it shirk, blasphemy. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they are doing with modernization is exactly what our, the Quran has condemned as blasphemy. Mm -hmm. The Lord God, on the first page of the book of history, declared that he's going to send on earth those who will be Khalifa. Mm -hmm. And then when he, he appointed Nabi Dawood, the prophet David, David, he said, Oh David, I am hereby appointing you as Khalifa. Mm -hmm. the, and the function of Khalifa, this is political science of the Quran. The function of the Khilafa state mm -hmm. is to establish law, establish governments, governance, establish rule mm -hmm. on the basis of truth. Truth, 
Abraham is that the Lord God, the whole earth belongs to him. Yes. So he has sovereignty over the earth. Political science and modernization and forces come from uh, Nair, mm -hmm. from the Antichrist, is that forget about this divine sovereignty. Mm -hmm. We now have the state is sovereign. But uh, excuse me, nowadays, for more than three centuries, we have uh, the most states are secular states. So there are um, uh, division between the state and the religion. Our world of Islam had until 1924 at least the external shell mm -hmm. of a holy state, <coughs> the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. because although it was corrupt and rotten at the center, mm -hmm. it still maintained the facade mm -hmm. of a holy state. But it was applying the Sharia, for example. After 1924, they went to work to ensure that the world of Islam would be broken up into bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. And now they are introducing us to the modern age mm -hmm. as nation states, yes. each of which would now dress up and go to the General Assembly of the United Nations and become a member of the United Nations organization. And territorial sovereignty is your right now. The state is sovereign. The Lord God is no longer sovereign. This is not going to last. It may have lasted since 1924. But our people are waking up now as we teach them the Quran. And there is a tomorrow which is coming when the holy state, the Khilafah state, will be restored. We have someone known as the Imam al-Mahdi. Mm -hmm. and, and when he comes, goodbye to Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia, excuse my language, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia will return to the garbage bin from where it emerged in the first place. Mm -hmm. And the Arabian Peninsula will be freed from this garbage. And a holy state or a Khilafah state it will be restored in Mecca. And when the Messiah returns, he will then restore <coughs> the holy state of Israel, of David and Solomon, in Jerusalem. And that would be the ruling state in the world. We believe that we will not be ruling the world in the end time. It's our brothers who follow the Messiah. You will rule the world in the end time. And our role in the world of Islam is to support you. Sheikh, I understand that. You explaining everything from the religious point of view. That's but, right. But politically, uh, we nowadays have in this great region, great Middle East, many uh, states, Gullivers, for example, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey, that has the ambition to be the center <coughs> of Islamic Khilafah. That's right. You put your finger on the button. Mm -hmm. That is precisely what they want to be to achieve. The leadership for Turkey over the whole world of Islam in Turkey, which is a member of NATO. Mm -hmm. So it's a Trojan horse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. A Turkey which is a member of NATO is gathering all the world of Islam mm -hmm. under its leadership mm -hmm. so that it will all serve NATO. But that is not going to succeed. Mm -hmm. No. You can see what is happening in Pakistan. You can see what happened in Algeria about 20, 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. What happened in Malaysia? Anwar Ibrahim was deputy prime minister. Mm -hmm. And he was using a secular nationalist platform to try to bring Islam in the political system. Yes. And he failed. He, he went failed. to jail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Algeria, they won the elections. And look what the in army 1990, did to them. Yes. In Indonesia, you have two states. <laughs> you have the government of Indonesia, and you have the people who are now striving for an Islamic model of a state. Mm -hmm. So it is there in the hearts of the people. They have not forgotten mm -hmm. the Khilafah state. 
and they are going to continue to strive for the restoration of the Khilafah state or the holy state, mm -hmm. which uh, Imam al-Mahdi will do in Mecca and the Messiah will do in Jerusalem. And I am working myself all the time in educating our people. Sheikh, Pakistan <clears throat> is one of the three states that doesn't recognize Armenia, <clears throat> Armenian sovereignty and Armenian independence. Pakistan is a huge Muslim country. It's a big country, nuclear country, and has its efficient existence in its region. region. Uh, but also is one of the main columns of Islamic world in general. Uh, at the same time, state which supplies logistic, political, cultural, financial, economic, military assistance to the anti-Armenian front, Turkey and Azerbaijan, and we saw this assistance during the 44-day war. You as a Pakistani origin, origin scholar, a wise man and a friend of Armenian people. How you and your colleagues can contribute or have a con contribution to defeat the wall of this hateness and ignorance? I'm not going to tell you all. <laughs> not at all. I'll tell you part. I have been blessed with a profile in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Pakistan has never had the freedom to have its own government. They will rule Pakistan in the interests of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Pakistan's government have always been made in Washington. Yes. And whenever a Pakistani leader strayed... After Lahore, do you think? Conference? Uh, huh? After Lahore, do you think? Lahore yes, you have the Lahore Islamic countries. Country. Whenever a Pakistani ruler strayed and resisted Washington, mm -hmm. he was always killed, assassinated. Imran Khan, who was educated in Oxford, was a very good cricketer. I don't know, you, you play cricket? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he said, I have come to Pakistan to raise the standard of the poor. But he didn't know the subject of how to do it. You don't change the people who are living in poverty with true charity. That's only a temporary relief. Mm -hmm. You need structural change in the economy. And he didn't know the subject. Mm -hmm. Hugo Chavez didn't know it as well in Venezuela. And mm -hmm. Nicolas Maduro also doesn't know it in Venezuela. Yes. Evo Morales didn't know it in Bolivia. The Soviet Union never knew it. With Castro their in Cuba. <laughs> Castro, they never understood you need a free and a fair market and you have to remove all of these nasty things in the free and the fair market which are corrupting the market. One of which is, of course, the system of banking and the monetary system, but we cannot take that up today. Mm -hmm. As soon as Imran Khan <laughs> made a statement, when the United States was defeated in Afghanistan, that is right, they were defeated. They spent 20 years trying to corrupt Afghanistan and they couldn't do it. And they had to retreat because Trump mm -hmm. decided they should retreat. The democratic administration. In and general. Biden couldn't change that. This is what Imran Khan said. And he had the courage and the integrity to say it. He said, Afghanistan has broken the shackles of slavery. Mm. And they mark for him that he has to be, he has mm. to go. When he went to, to Moscow on the eve of the military intervention in Ukraine, mm -hmm. he never condemned Moscow. He refused to do that. Mm -hmm. And he was happy that he went to, to Moscow. When they imposed sanctions on Moscow, he said, no, we, will, we continue to buy oil from Moscow. We'll continue to buy grain from Moscow. We're not going to submit to your sanctions. Mm -hmm. 
And so they removed him with a US dollar regime change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have, therefore, to sympathize with the Pakistani people mm -hmm. who have their hearts in the, in the right place. Mm -hmm. And who, when they know what is happening with Armenia, mm -hmm. when they know, I never knew, for example, Mm -hmm. I probably heard about it, that Pakistan has not recognized mm -hmm. Armenia. It was, off, it was not in my consciousness until I came here. Mm -hmm. When the Pakistani people are told that this is a part of the plan of the enemy, mm -hmm. they will now rise up mm -hmm. and they will now demand on their government that Armenia must be recognized. Mm -hmm. But uh, how do we do that? I'm not going to speak on that. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, my last question, uh, what can we do? Uh, maybe we can organize many conferences, scientific conferences, meetings between Muslim scholars, between Armenians, here in Armenia, in Yerevan, or maybe in many communities in diaspora. I know that the Armenian communities living in the Middle East are very active in this field because all of Armenians have that uh, positive image and reputation uh, among uh, the Muslim communities. What we can do? One must not be offended that around the world today most of mankind is in a state of drift, mm -hmm. losing their anchorage and imitating modern West. The most dangerous part of that imitation is when you lose the truth which has come from the Lord God mm -hmm. and there it takes you on a path mm -hmm. different from that. My role, my humble role in Armenia is to gently gently point out to you in Armenia what you need to be reminded about because of my Islamic eschatology to return to the path of truth mm -hmm. politically, economically, monetarily mm -hmm. because I get the impression that you need that. Uh, yes, we need to have meetings where we can come together in the future. More important than scholars coming together, mm -hmm. vastly more important, is our peoples coming together. Mm -hmm. And there's a plan that we have that I'm not going to disclose for next summer, in which uh, we hope and we pray we make a significant step in the direction mm -hmm. of bringing our peoples together. together. Yeah, in Armenia. I'll pray for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shaif, for this important and very interesting interview. Thank you, Abraham, and I pray that we will be able to do this again and again. Next year. Next you year. promised. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. This was my interview with the philosopher, political thinker, and Sheikh Imran Nazar Hussein. This was Abraham Gasparian. Good night. Yes, it was.